The returns from such a consecration are normally inestimable, as exemplified in the cases of the United States of America and Israel. Against this background, where Ghana stands now is a cause for grave lamentation. Ghana is heavily blessed in terms of natural and human resources. So one is justified to, to ask why the economic and social hardships. That said, my mandate for this lecture as per my invitation letter is in these terms. Sharing my lived experiences with the justice delivery system vis-a-vis -vis public confidence in the judiciary to our recent judicial pronouncements and rulings portend for consideration of Ghana's democracy. This is against the backdrop that the African youth are increasingly losing hope in the democratic experiment and are manifesting same by pouring onto the streets to show support for military junctors who overthrow democratically elected civilian regimes. Indeed, the flyer on this invitation is in even wider terms. My lived experiences. Everything has a beginning. When I was informed too in Notre Dame Secondary School in Abrongo, our Latin master put before us a number of mottos for our choice. Some chose Orando et Laborando, Fidelis in Parvo, etc. I chose Justicia Omnibus, and I still love it. When I commenced my private legal practice at Bolgatanga in the then upper region of Ghana in August 1975, I soon realized that there was much corruption in the judicial system. By the grace of God, I stayed out of it, though it was very challenging. <laughs> Should have been with me there, you see. <laughs> My cousin uh, could be a, a very good witness <laughs> to some of it. In the web of the 1979 revolution, a neighbor of mine was badly brutalized by some soldiers and he sent for me to hear his story and see his condition. Despite the heat of the revolutionary atmosphere, I issued a writ against them and they came to seek settlement. Unsurprisingly, their terms of settlement centered around smoking the peace pipe in the form of sharing a roasted fowl. <laughs> I rejected this and kept to the writ. Unfortunately, their duties in Bolgatanga had ended and they immediately returned to Accra. And my attempt to serve them with fed up court processes received no cooperation from their command structure. After the third first December Revolution, I was appointed chairman of the then Upper Regional Investigations Committee, and subsequently also, briefly, as the acting special public prosecutor for the same region. I'll explain this. I actually uh, moved in uh, to, to do this for some time, because here was a revolution to cleanse the system of corruption, abuses of all kinds. My assistant was a very intelligent police officer, but his um, honesty was below sea level. <laughs> <laughs> so perceiving this, I said, no, if I don't step in, this man will turn things back. So briefly, I stepped in 
and has appointed acting special public prosecutor. That's for a brief period. Um, in the course of time, a flight lieutenant from Accra came to Bolgatanga and asked why there were only a few cases for trial by the National Public Tribunal when it came to try cases in the upper region. I told him that the crime rate differs from region to region. He then asked about our investigation into the affairs of the then Farmers Services Company, FASCO, of the upper region. I told him that our committee had spent three months thoroughly investigating that case and that we were not prepared to change anything. He went away. Now, let me interpose. Um, well, there was so few cases. When the upper regional uh, public tribunal was set up, before we commence work, our hearing on the airwaves, people sentenced to 50 years imprisonment, and all kinds of things. So I told them that you cannot right a wrong with further wrong. These kinds of sentences are too outrageous. And so I told them, and they agreed with me, that except in the very worst cases, nobody should be imprisoned. I was a prosecutor. In addition, one evening, a major of the Ghana Army from the Kamina Barracks in Tamale came to intervene in our committee's investigation into a case involving his nephew and his colleague officer who was temporarily stationed at Balgatanga introduced him to me that evening. I told him that we would attend to him the next morning. The next morning, I had him called into our committee sitting room and had him sworn. I then asked what was his mission. He could not testify meaningfully. I then addressed him that it was they, the army, that launched the revolution to ensure justice prevailed. So how could that be achieved if they tried to obstruct the due flow of justice? He became uneasy and was glad to be told to go his way. He saluted us and left. These are a few episodes. I found myself appointed from the bar to the Supreme Court on 30th November 1995. I soon noticed that public confidence in the judiciary was of considerable concern in that there were perceptions of corruption and slanted judicial positions, especially in constitutional cases. There were frequent calls for the entire number of justices of the Supreme Court to be empaneled on constitutional cases. I propose to try to unearth the causes for these perceptions, which were built up over the years. The perceptions were aroused by perceptions of political inclinations on the part of some judges. There is a long history to it. Sometimes the suspicion was anchored on the incidence of political influence. This occurred in various ways, various degrees, and at various times. Political confrontation. On 20th April 1970, the Court of Appeal, Koram, Apalu, Serebo, Sowa, Enin, and Archer JJA gave judgment in Sala versus the Attorney General. It's reported in 2 GNG 739, second edition, 1319. The 
The court upheld the plaintiff's claim for a declaration that his employment as a manager with the GNTC had been wrongly terminated by the Buzia regime. This decision meant that well over 350 other persons whose employments were similarly affected would also successfully sue the government. Before the, co the court could hear the case, unsuccessful objections on the grounds of bias were raised against Apalu JA on the ground of close friendship with the plaintiff, and so a JA on the ground that his brother-in-law's wife had approached him to help her husband, Jonas, who was similarly affected as Salah by the termination of his employment. In the evening of that day, 20 April 1970, of the delivery of the judgment, an incensed Dr. Buzia, the then Prime Minister of Ghana, made a radio broadcast on this judgment, the full text of which is in 2 G and G 739, 2nd edition, 1374. Inter earlier, he filmed as follows, uh, 1378 to 1379. Quote, if any others who were not reappointed in the recent implementation of the transitional provisions of the Constitution wish to sue the government, they are at liberty to do so. The government will not stop them. But if they hope thereby to coerce the government to employ them, then they will be wasting their time and money. My government will exercise its right to employ only those whom it wishes to employ. No court can enforce any decision that seeks to compel the government to employ or re-employ anyone. That would be a futile exercise. I wish to make that perfectly clear. This outburst flew in the face of Article 102 Plus 3 of the 1969 Constitution of Ghana that, quote, in the exercise of the judicial power of Ghana, the judiciary in both its judicial and administrative functions shall be subject only to this Constitution and shall not be subject to the control or direction of any other person or authority, unquote. Article 115, Clause 1, Clause 1 and 2 of the said 1969 Constitution of Ghana provided as follows, quote, the Chief Justice shall be appointed by the President, acting in, consult in consultation with the Council of State by a warrant under his hand and the presidential seal. The other judges of the Superior Court of Judicature shall be appointed by the President by a warrant under his hand and the Presidential Seal acting in accordance with the advice of the Judicial Council. Now, throughout my presentation, you will notice that there's always a difference between the mode of appointment of the Chief Justice and the other judges. That one must be by the President uh, and the Vice in consultation with the Council of State. So, um, this has been the consistent thing. Um, I don't know whether it's meant to kidnap the Chief Justice uh, administrative. You know, we shall see. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Consequent upon the judgment, this judgment, I want to write to you, Justices Azukrab and Apalu, who after Olenu J.A. were the most senior justices of the Court of Appeal, see the list under the heading Judges of the Superior Court of Ghana contained in 1968 Ghana Law Report. E.A.L. Bannerman, who had been a senior magistrate, the equivalent of a circuit judge, Circuit Court Judge was appointed the Chief Justice of Ghana. And K.O. Labi, the private legal practitioner, and Siribo J.A., the only judge who ruled in favor of the Buzi administration in that Salah case, were made senior judges over them on the Supreme Court. What was more, 
BCRAC Club, who in 1968 was the 11th most senior high court judge out of a list of 12 high court judges, see under judges of the Superior Court of Ghana, 1968 Ghana Law Report, was appointed from the high court to the Supreme Court as a senior over and above Azukra and Apalu JJ. The appointment aroused public scrutiny as revealed in Bedou versus the Republic, 1974, Volume 2, Ghana Law Report 361. Thereat, the facts of the case are summarized in the head note as follows. Quote, the appellant, the editor of a newspaper, the spokesman, published a front page editorial commenting on the appointment of judges to the Supreme Court established under the suspended constitution of 1969, which indicated that the appointments, including that of the first prosecution witness, as BCRC, were improper. The editorial also impu imputed that the first prosecution witness, who was at the material time the High Court judge, was unfit to hold the post of a Supreme Court judge, and that as interim electoral commissioner, he had, during the 1969 general elections, misconducted himself by showing bias in favor of the winning party. The appellant was therefore charged with intentional libel arising from the publication. Justice VCRC Crab turned out to be a very top judge. He was very good, very principled, Lord. But what raised the eyebrows of this editor of the spokesman paper was that he was almost the, the most senior high court judge. And find Apalu and were on the Court of Appeal many years. Uh, when this Salah case came, it went against the revolution. Then, former circuit judge, made chief justice, this one brought as a senior to these ones. Um, again, the plaintiff into four versus attorney general, 1980, Ghana Law Report 634 CA, sitting as the Supreme Court, successfully claimed that even though the 1979 constitution preserved existing offices at the time it came into force, President Le Mans purported to nominate Apalu, who was a sitting Chief Justice for parliamentary approval to be Chief Justice anew. Parliament rejected him on very tenuous grounds. Otherwise, Apalu CJ would have been ousted and the demand government would have had a free hand to pick the Chief Justice of his liking with his alternate implications. Uh, let us see the politics in this. This man was retained by a clause of the Constitution which preserved existing offices. It's very clear. Nonetheless, politically, he probably thought uh, he was not uh, suitable. So the man played the trick. Oh, I'm nominating you as my Chief Justice. By his politicians are waiting in Parliament to fail him in the vet. Some of the things. And they did. But if Dr. Uh, to fall, sadly I understand he has passed. It's going to be a costly mistake to make that attempt. He came to a school party and challenged this decision. Incidentally, um, the present president, if I recollect, and Chachu, were his counsel. And they succeeded in obtaining a judgment, uh, retaining Apalu as the Chief Justice of the Republic. The very sterling Chief Justice. Uh, oh, I see. This, this is your mic. This is my mic. And the rest? <laughs> 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 
I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, now I confine myself to my vocal jurisdiction. <laughs>
proper party to apply in this case is the people or the republic. The office of the special public prosecutor is none of these. If the special public prosecutor had mounted a full-blown action under Article 2 of the Constitution 1992, that is enforcement of the Constitution provision, perhaps different considerations might arise. For the present, however, its local standard is questionable. Nonetheless, as this case raises constitutional issues of some importance, I propose to deal with it on the merits and not dismiss it justifiably on the foregoing grounds and risk being accused unjustifiably of deciding it on so-called technicalities, even if those perceived technicalities are part of the laws which the courts are enjoined to interpret and enforce. So we we'll see whether this judge felt free enough. This was before the return to constitutional rule to decide the case according to the law he knew. Judicial admissions of executive intrusion uh, of the judicial. The 1980-12 Review of Ghana Law, at pages two to three, Apalu CJ, in paying tribute to the late Akufado CJ, and President of Ghana, uh, and this time beat me, I, but I'll see to this man, Akufado CJ. Quote, for a lawyer of his caliber, Elevation to the bench was a matter of course. To most lawyers, that is the culmination of a successful legal career. It came in 1962 after he was in the law for 22 years, having been called to the bar in 1940. Such honor was deserved much earlier. That, oh, oh I see. <laughs> Uh, that it did not come quicker cannot be explained by want of merit but by the political alignment of the day but when it did arrive its undue delay was acknowledged because he made history by being appointed together with lawyer R.S. Blay the then highest court of the land, namely the Supreme Court, bypassing the High Court in the process. He was not destined to remain long in that court, because ironically as it seems, one of the treasured qualities of a judge which he possessed and exhibited became his undoing. He had the courage of his conviction and spoke his mind firmly in a judicial decision which displeased the then power in the land. He was dismissed in February 1964, having been on the bench for less than two years. But merit, like cork, never remains submerged. Just over two years afterwards, that was after the coup, obviously, he was returned, this is the system. He was returned to the bench to fill his highest office of Chief Justice. He remained in that office till August 1970, when he was invited to occupy a still higher office, the presidency of Ghana. On the whole, he occupied high judicial office for just over five years and did so with great distinction. So um, let me pause a little. This type of man we ought to celebrate. In the kind of frenzied, rapid politics that is being played in this country, we find on social media, people trying to criticize the president, president, we all know it's his son. But what is this man, what is this man's part in it? We try to run him down. Also, I mean, Ghanaians, let us be fair on all matters and all occasions. That is what can sanitize this country and let things work well. Your, your bolder print. 
risk constituted by my purpose. <laughs> and Inspector General of Police, 1993 to 94, two Ghana Law Report 459 at 469 to 470 SC, Amwa Sechi, JLC, commenting on the statutory reversal of an acquittal and retrial of certain leading personalities on the charge of treason, bluntly said, quote, <coughs> acquitted in proceedings entitled State versus Autry, 1963, 2 Ghana Law Report 463 SC. The verdicts were set aside by executive order. See Special <coughs> Criminal Division Instrument, 1963 EI-161. Put back on trial before a more pliant bench, the executive had the satisfaction of seeing them convicted and sentenced to death. Mercifully, the sentences were not carried out. But a grave precedent had been set. The judges were not spared. Corsa CJ was removed from office, and the constitutional amendment cleared the way for the dismissal of Aduma Bosman J. as it then was, and other judges whose loyalty to the absolute state was now called in question. Unquote. Again, in Waku versus Attorney General, 1993 to 94, two Ghana Law Report, 396 SC, MOSHJSC, French Antilles stated as follows. After the overthrow of the Nkrumah regime, the judiciary came in for much criticism for the role, eh, okay. <laughs> for the role it had, um, sorry, for the role it had played while the previous government was in power. It was said that it had departed from its traditional role as an independent arm of government and had become a willing tool of repression in the hands of the executive. It was also said that some of the appointments to the bench had been politically motivated in that persons with known sympathies for the regime had been favored over those who exhibited an independent frame of mind. Well, still, it was said that some of the judges had become so depraved and demoralized that they habitually took bribes. The answer of the new administration was the wholesale dismissal of judges, cleansing the original stables as it were, and appointing new ones to take their place. But it was soon realized that merely cleansing person changing personnel would not be enough what was required was a reappraisal of the role of the judge in the body politic and the creation of the conditions necessary for the proper exercise of his functions, unquote. In Hansen versus Ankara, 1987-88, Ghana Law Report 639 and 667, Sowa JLC said, quote, before I'm done, I consider it ethically and judicially unacceptable the comments on the composition of the panel in this appeal. If my brother Taylor JLC had reservations, he should have made them abundantly clear before hearing, and not after opinions have been rendered which are contrary to his own. And in any event, the judges referred to are by all standards including their knowledge of the law and integrity, competent to adorn the Supreme Court bench. It is by sheer accident of past politics that they have not taken precedence over some members of the Supreme Court. This long-standing, so um, just trying to emphasize that from the beginning, there has been complete attempt to dominate the judiciary, and that there has been steady political influence of the judiciary. It's not just myself. That's why I'm quoting authorities from judges, eminent judges, more eminent than myself, uh, to that effect. This long-standing skepticism of the independence of the judiciary, and now the Supreme Court in particular, led to the issuance of the following practice direction 
on a paneling of justices of the Supreme Court reported in 2000 Supreme Court Ghana Law Report 586 as follows. Quote, practice direction. Practice in empaneling justices of the Supreme Court, 10th January 2001. It is provided by the Constitution, 1992, Articles 1, 2, 5, 4, and 1, 4, 4, 6. That, quote, 1, 2, 5, 4. The Chief Justice shall, subject to this Constitution, be the head of the judicial and shall be responsible for the administration and supervision of the judicial. 1446, where the office of the Chief Justice is vacant, or where the Chief Justice is for any reason unable to perform the functions of his office, A, until a person has been appointed to and has assumed the functions of that office, or B, until the person holding that office has resumed the functions of that office, those functions shall be performed by the most senior of the justices of the Supreme Court. And exercising the functions of the office under Articles 1254 and 1446 of the 1992 Constitution, His Lordship, the Acting Chief Justice, where his letter dated 10th January 2001, addressed to all the justices of the Supreme Court and copied to the Judicial Secretary and the Registrar of the Supreme Court, directed as follows, quote, in order to minimize the mounting criticisms and the persistent public outcry against the judicial in all justice delivery and to restore public confidence, it is my desire that where practical and especially in constitutional matters, all available justices of the Supreme Court have a constitutional right to sit or at least seven justices of the court. This was in 2000, not long ago. In view of the above, and in the instant case, uh, Republic vs. High Court, Bolgatanga, and Haji Afati Sedu, Esparte Hawa Yekubu, Civil Motion No. 2, so 2001, by virtue of the powers conferred on the Chief Justice by Article 1, 25 clause 4, and on me by Article 146, I have decided that Honorable Justice Sofia Kufu and myself, that is say Honorable Justice E.K. Redu, Acting Chief Justice, be added to the justices already panel. Signed, Honorable Mr. Justice E.K. Redu, Acting Chief Justice. Editorial note, in persons of the above directive, the panel of seven justices of the Supreme Court quorum, Edward Redu, Acting CJ, Ajaben, Akwa, Atukuba, as Adan was. <laughs> so far, Kufu, <laughs> Lamte, and Ajoy, JJSC, and Republic vs. High Court, Polkatanga, Esparte, Hawaii, Akubu. Civil motion, I've already read that. Unanimously granted, reserving the reasons, the application by Madam Hawaii, Akubu, and other of Sheshirare, Watch the proceedings in order of the High Court Bogatanga, dated 6 January 2001, in an electoral petition resulting from the 7 December 2000 parliamentary elections for Boko Central constituency. In the respectful view of the editor, the above practice direction issued by His Lordship, the Honorable Acting Chief Justice, is to be most welcomed by all members of the bench and bar, and the general public. And it may also be considered as very appropriate and long overdue. The practice direction in the form of a letter to all the justices of the Supreme Court makes the empaneling of the Supreme Court for the determination of the constitutional cases more transparent and more importantly, the direction is in line with the democratic aspirations of all Ghanaians and the sustenance of the rule of law in the country. It has also the obvious merit of insulating and freeing the high office of Chief Justice from all imaginary and unproven but disturbing allegations of political bias in the empaneling of the justices of the Supreme Court. 
unquote. <coughs> now, I pause to make this comment that if you have a court that is not independent and honest and principled, this type of directive is not going to solve anything. And panel the whole lot of politically inclined justice. What, what, what will be the effect? Not anyway. It was not yet like that at our time. This cartoon, as noted as at pages 48 to 49 of Dr. Date Ban's formidable book, Reflections on the Supreme Court of Ghana, um, has persisted under the current Chief Justice. He thereat states as follows, I'm quoting from that table, that time it was not this Chief Justice, when it was referred to his time. Quote, the Chief Justice's power to empanel judges confers on him or her, arguably the opportunity or potential to influence the outcome of particular cases. The Chief Justice's knowledge of an individual judge's track record on particular issues or his or her judicial inclinations on particular issues may give the Chief Justice this potential. This, rightly or wrongly, has attracted unfavorable comment from people in political circles in relation to politically controversial decisions. It is in re reaction to such comments uh, Chief Justice Georgina Wood decided that she would, during her tenure, empanel as a matter of practice a bench of nine justices to hear all constitutional cases. So that's why 2013 found me on a panel of nine election petition. On this current practice, the Constitution Review Commission commented that it finds in regard to Ghana's judicial practice that no law has ever prescribed the maximum number of justices of the Supreme Court that should sit on a case brought before the court, though it has been the practice to specify the quorum. It has noted that this is a deliberate policy on the part of the lawmakers to allow the highest courts a certain flexibility and freedom in deciding when to fill a full complement of members depending on the gravity of the case and the need for a reconsideration of the law. It acknowledges that this practice has helped ensure that in the adjudication of matters of importance as many judicial minds as possible would be involved in settling the law and making a definitive pronouncement. In this regard, the Commission commends the emerging practice by which nine justices of the Supreme Court are empaneled to sit on constitutional cases." Unquote. The legal colossus, Dr. Dante Baji, has retired at page 201 of his third book, has further observed as follows, quote, a perception and conviction by the public of the Supreme Court's impartiality between parties in its adjudication is vital to his fulfillment of his broader role. Nevertheless, there has in recent years been a degree of controversy in the media as to the impartiality of the judiciary in general in disputes between the government, by which is meant the executive, and the individual. This has been a challenge to the Supreme Court, along with other courts. Um, this has, has had, oh yes, uh, other courts has, have had to live with. The challenge has arisen from the highly competitive nature of Ghanaian party politics in the last decade and the perceived tendency for a party in government to, pers to prosecute politicians belonging to the opposition. The court has been caught in the middle of this conflict 
and in their endeavor to do justice between parties before them, have incurred the wrath of political party activists of the governing party who have alleged that the judiciary is biased against the government. The best response to this challenge is for the conduct of the judiciary to manifest its indubitable impartiality. I repeat that. The best response to this challenge is for the conduct of the judiciary to manifest its in indubitable impartiality. Now, pausing here, we cannot have a politically slanted judiciary able to exhibit indubitable impartiality. What is not there is not there. Simple as that. On the other hand, Dr. Dateba JSC, uh, retired in his aforementioned book, says at pages 211 to 212 regarding this matter, thus the mode of appointment of justices of the Supreme Court is specified by Article 144 of the 1992 Constitution. It provides for the appointment by the President acting on the advice of the Judicial Council in consultation with the Council of State and with the approval of Parliament. Thus, both the executive and the legislature are involved in the process. The intention of the framers of the Constitution, as confirmed by practice, appears to be that nominations should be made by the Judicial Council, although the appointments the appointment is by the president. The names of nominees recommended by the Judicial Council are forwarded to the president who places them before the Council of State for their views. If the views of the Council of State are not negative, the president then forwards the names to the Speaker of Parliament for parliamentary better. It should be noted, however, that presidents in the Fourth Republic have not considered themselves bound by the advice of the Judicial Council in relation to nominations for appointment to the Supreme Court. Presidents have on occasion refused to accept some nominees recommended by the Judicial Council. Under a constitution on the Westminster model, such as that enforced in Ghana between 1957 and 1960, the Governor General was obliged to follow the advice given him on judicial appointments. However, this convention and understanding have not survived into the Republican era. Ordinarily, presidents tend to accept the nomination of the Judicial Council as it has to be remembered. The Attorney General, the President's principal legal advisor, and four nominees of the president serve on the Judicial Council. The president does has ample opportunity to influence the nominations by the Judicial Council. Furthermore, because the constitutional provision requires Parliament's prior approval, Parliament has a veto power over the appointment of any Supreme Court justice. I'm pausing here a little. You want a judiciary to be free apart from the Attorney General who is appointed as a political minister by the President. The President has four other nominees on the Judicial Council to ensure what impartiality. <laughs> judicial compromise of independence. Sometimes the judiciary gives the impression that it is giving an undue advantage to the executive. The National Media Commission versus Attorney General 2000 Supreme Court General Report 1 was on that panel. The National Media Commission complained to the Attorney General that the President was usurping their clear authority under Article 168 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana, quote, to appoint the chairman and other members of the governing bodies of public corporations managing the state-owned media in consultation with the president, unquote. When it was unheeded, 
it sealed the Attorney General in the Supreme Court for a declaration in January 1996. However, it was not until November 1999 that the suit was listed for hearing. And judgment was given in favor of the plaintiff on 26 January 2000, by which date the then President Rawlings had left office after two presidential terms of office. Now, what was the problem in listing the constitutional case? 1996, 1999. Why? Meanwhile, the president, who was not the authority, was appointing these people to manage the state-owned media. These things. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Um, This trend has continued in very recent times. Thus, in Ghana Center for Democratic Development and eight others versus Attorney General, as a Megache JSC delivering the judgment of the Supreme Court stated, judgment was delivered in this case on the 21st May 2023, long after Mr. Domelevo had been pushed out of office. Coincidentally, it was on the same day that the Supreme Court also delivered judgment in the case of Professor Kwejo Apiaje Etua, uh, a Northern background, okay, <laughs> and seven others, and the Attorney General. In this case, the plaintiffs challenged the constitutionality of the Imposition of Restrictions Act 2020, Act 1012, which was enacted in consequence of the deadly coronavirus. COVID-19 pandemic. Thank God that is passed. But the um, developed countries are saying a more serious one will come. They are not God anyway. It can, hap it can unhappily be said that the Supreme Court acted unconstitutionally and in bad faith when it inord inordinately delayed <coughs> in adjudicating the National Media Commission and Attorney General, as on that panel, as I said, but don't blame me. I was not in charge of listing. <laughs> when it was listed three years later, we promptly, it was in November, we decided it within a month or so. Still, the blame comes from the judiciary. Um, as well as the Domenico and COVID-19 cases for short. This is because, okay, let me explain this better. I'm saying that it can be said that the Supreme Court sometimes has acted unconstitutional and in bad faith. And I'm referring to National Media Commission and Attorney General, as well as the Domingo and COVID-19 cases. I told you about the national media. In the case of Domingo, I told you, Judgment came long, long, long after the man had left. In the COVID-19, those impositions have had their thorough effect. The COVID-19 itself has passed. Now judgment has come saying that they were unconstitutional. <laughs> this is because it is the constitutional duty of the Supreme Court to enforce the constitution forthwith when it is breached. That is the mandatory duty under Article 2.1 of the Constitution. Thus, in Guedima versus Awana Williams, 2 G and G, 739, 2nd edition, 1167, at 1175, Zucram, J.A. As it then was said, quote, the pith of the plaintiff's claim as expressed in paragraph eight of his statement of claim is that on 5th September, 1969, the defendant took his seat as member of the National Assembly, notwithstanding the fact that he was not qualified so to do by virtue of Article 71, Clause 2B, 2, and D of the Constitution, and that the defendant intends to continue it, uh, to sit in the said National Assembly. If the matter rests here, 
than prima facie. There has been an infringement of the Constitution and an alleged threat to continue such infringement. This will constitute a mischief and it will become the inescapable duty of the Supreme Court to suppress it by enforcing the Constitution. Those days, our judges would speak. Unquote. In the National Media Commission, Domenico and COVID-19 cases, the Supreme Court failed to suppress the mischiefs of the infringements of the Constitution for an inordinate period of time. Of course, as I said earlier, the delay can come from the panel or is uh, uh, listing for hearing. And we all know who can uh, direct listing of cases in the Supreme Court. The entertainment and determination of the James Jachi Quasin's case as Michael and Command Nympha versus James Jachi Quasin and two others. Rate number J1 11 22, 17th May 2023 by the Supreme Court is quite unfortunate. Though the court, in my humble view, was misled by the earlier decision of the Supreme Court in Sumaila Bell number one and Ramani and another 2011, one Supreme Court, Ghana Law Report 132. Even then, the Bia Bell case was not, unlike the Jachi Quason case, determined on its merits by the High Court and the Court of Appeal. However, the determinative consideration is that the Constitution has clearly assigned post-parliamentary election matters to the High Court under Article 99 and post-presidential election matters to the Supreme Court. These provisions are specific while the provisions of Articles, Articles 2 and 130 are general and therefore verba generalia, specialibus non derogant. This is particularly, well, I think this um, general words cannot override or derogate from special words. <coughs> These provisions, uh, okay, this is particularly so since in re parliamentary elections for Wulensi constituency, Zakaria versus Nimakam, 2003 to 2004, one Supreme Court General Report 1 has decided, though I disagree with it, that post parliamentary election matters end at the Court of Appeal level. It is so in some other jurisdictions. Common sense is also a rule of the construction of statutes. Therefore, since parliamentary elections occur okay, in as many as 275 constituencies in our country, the Constitution could not have reasonably contemplated and provided that post-parliamentary election matters should be litigated in the centralized Supreme Court, unlike the singular and unitary post-presidential elections. If it is a consideration that the constitutional breach cannot be left unredressed after the 21-day period for presenting a parliamentary election petition, can it also be argued that after the 21 days period under Article 16 and under Article 64 of the 1992 Constitution, a person can bring an action under Articles 2 and 130 of the Constitution to invalidate a presidential election? That cannot be done. See Metal Nunu and others versus Electoral Commission 2011 uh, Volume 2 Supreme Court Ghana Law Report 1250. Uh, and as except otherwise provided by the Constitution under Article 130, which comprehends Article 2 also, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is exclusive of all other courts. How can the Supreme Court have concurrent jurisdiction over any matter with another court 
which is the implication if the Supreme Court purports to adjudicate post-parliamentary electoral matters alongside the High Court. So, I wish to emphasize this. The jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, so original jurisdiction, under Articles 2, 1, and 130, right together, are stated to be exclusive, which means there's no sharing, no haircuts of any kind. <laughs> Just using this for fun, don't politicize me. <laughs> don't think I'm talking politics. I'm completely devoid of politics. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's untenable to think that both the Supreme Court and the High Court can detain parliamentary electoral cases. There cannot be concurrence and exclusivity at the same time. That's what I'm emphasizing. There are instances in which it may be felt <coughs> that some members <coughs> of the judiciary pay allegiance apparently to the executive or otherwise instead of to Ghana. Despite the clear provisions of Article 146, the very knowledgeable Chief Justice of Ghana wrote on two occasions to a justice of the Supreme Court terminating his tenure as a Supreme Court judge on the ground of ill health without complying with the said Article 146. On being shown the letters by the judge concerned, I strongly exhorted him to reply them, raising the contravention of Article 146. He did so same Chief Justice wrote again that some doctors had uh, examined him and certified that he was unfit. I told the judge he's still not in compliance with Article 146. Because a medical board is prescribed that to be convened in sources, and this is not how it is. Luckily for him, uh, in the end, he retired. Uh, and, uh, equitable circumstances. This, the same Chief Justice indirectly suspended me, me, uh, for six months, by not impaling me on any case immediately after I maintained my solo dissent in Chachu Chikata and the Republic when it came up for review by the Supreme Court. Now, I wanted to sue him, but I had to assess my chances. <laughs> but clearly, he had in the power. Uh, but you have to be realistic. <laughs> so instead, I went to Kwega, who was then the most senior justice. CEO. Uh, they were very close. But, uh, well, anyway. So all he told me was that, oh, don't worry. If after some time the bar does not see your judgments in the law reports, they will not sit down. So, all right. I went. And um, <clears throat> what brought me back <laughs> to the pilot? Uh, Bright Equity. Then you've heard of him. A very courageous lawyer. Uh, he's rather into politics. He brought a petition. Uh, he he uh, sent a petition to the president for the removal of this same chief justice on very serious grounds. But well, I didn't wear this so well. Uh, this action was rolled back to the Supreme Court. Somebody challenged it and was thrown out as an improper invocation of Article 146. But there were serious allegations. You ask judges to do certain things in a certain way. They do agree to transfer them almost outside Ghana. Well, but there's difference. You know, no. Why are you in Accra here and not at Elubo or something? <laughs> okay, these things matter. Yes. Shouldn't joke with them. When we allow them, 
the system will be jaundiced and the present situation is what we can be in. I'm not saying it has started yet, that's why I'm taking time to show. It has to be broken. In the end, I'll say that. <clears throat> um, before I of the Supreme Court, contrary to Article 1446, who should act as the Chief Justice uh, in his absence? I felt that since the Supreme Court is the custodian of the Constitution, I could not condone its infractions. Yes, because you say you are a Supreme Court judge. You are to defend and protect the Constitution. And the provision relating to the Supreme Court itself is being fractured and you do nothing allow it to pass, then what kind of Supreme Court? So, I therefore assumed the functions of the Chief Justice with clearance from the then most senior justice, who was then very seriously indisposed and handicapped, until I got to know from him very shortly afterwards that he had become fit enough to act as Chief Justice upon the death of the then incumbent Chief Justice. It is this event which led Kweku Baku, a very prominent journalist, to state on a radio program that in the bid for the post of Chief Justice, I declared myself as the acting Chief Justice. But when they said most senior justice of the Supreme Court got wind of it, he said, I'm quoting him, you lie, I can act. When I heard that allegation, I was gravely hurt since I have never in my life made any move to be appointed the Chief Justice of Ghana because I consider lobbying for a position as a corrupt act since it involves compromising one's conscience. <laughs> Constitutionalism in Ghana. These sort of things do not augur well for constitutionalism in Ghana, which it is the primary duty of the courts to ensure. Our 1992 constitution has ordained constitutionalism for Ghana. This is plain from particularly articles 1, 2, 3, and 35 of the constitution, which provide inter alia for the sovereignty and welfare of the people of Ghana, the supremacy and enforcement of the constitution, and the blessings of democracy. Constitutionalism has been well explained by some eminent jurists in Ghana. In his very able book, Constitutional Law of Ghana, Text, Cases, and Commentary, Professor E. Kofi Abochi states at page 32 thus, Constitutionalism as a concept can be defined as the limitation placed on the exercise of legal and political power. The concept of constitutionalism is peculiarly important for African countries, given the long-standing experience of dictatorship, anarchy, and misrule on the continent. As followers, constitutionalism and responsible government have been said to be mutually reinforced. Constitutionalism promotes responsible government in the sense that it compels government to act in a manner consistent with the expectations for the enforcement, uh, for the confirmation of power and respond to feedback from the citizen. This is what is missing in Africa. I, I like that part where he says, um, constitutionalism promotes responsible government in that in the sense that it compels government to act in a manner consistent with the expectations for the confirmation of power and respond to feedback from the citizen. In this context, one can accept that constitutionalism is a welfare-oriented concept to the extent that it seeks to ultimately champion the welfare of the government by ensuring that governments exercise conferred powers in the best interest of the government. 
brilliant and beautiful. This is what our constitution has ordained for us. Is it happening? No. Very well. Um, <clears throat> also, in his thoroughly researched book, The New Constitutional and Administrative Law of Ghana, from the Garden of Eden to 2022, Professor Raymond Atuba states at page two as follows, quote, the mere existence of a constitution is not enough for proper governance. A constitution can lead to constitutionality or constitutionalism. Constitutionality is the rule of law at the constitutional level, no matter what the content of the law is that rules. Constitutionalism, on the other hand, is good governance or people-centered governance at a constitutional level. With constitutionalism, there is limited government, people-centeredness, protection of minority and other rights, fairness, justice, equity. In countries such as the United States, which practice constitutionality and not constitutionalism, a constitution exists alongside social concerns like racism, gender inequity, and the prison's industrial complex. These are incompatible with the countries that practice constitutionalism. See also Professor Dati Banks' very scholarly book, Selected Papers and Lectures on Ghanaian Law, page 76. The appointment of judges, particularly of the Supreme Court, as the fulcrum of constitutionalism and the rule of law has its hiccups. It is the Judicial Council that recommends suitable lawyers or judges for eventual appointment by the president. Sometimes, some judges are recommended by the Judicial Council to the Supreme Court over and above more experienced and senior judges even though they are not more competent and experienced than their seniors. Often, when there is regime change, some of the sideline senior judges now get recommended for appointment to the Supreme Court through the same judicial council, but they then become juniors to their earlier juniors by reason of their later appointment. In practice, however, these later appointed judges often write the unanimous or lead judgments in difficult cases shortly after their appointment to the Supreme Court. Certainly, eyebrows can be raised over such practices. What can be the justification for such things? Nonetheless, depending to some extent on the judicial season, the judiciary has deepened constitutionalism in Ghana, notably the nullification of the 31st December holiday celebration funded from public funds, the freedom of choice of independent counsel by state bodies instead of the Attorney General despite Article 885, where there is conflict of interest, see a mega by Attorney General uh, 1, 2012, 1 Supreme Court, Ghana Law Report 679. National Media Commission and Attorney General. So though that case delayed, but we unanimously held that the President had no power to appoint the persons managing the state uh, the statutory bodies managing the state-owned media. As stated by Professor Dateba in his third book at pages 17 to 18, constitutionalism is about having limits to the powers of constitutional bodies and enforcing those limits. The judiciary, through its exercise of the power of judicial review, is accordingly a vital actor in this process. The Ghana Supreme Court has been quite effective in protecting the legal framework of the liberal multi-party democracy, who has grown up in the 1992, is the 1992 Constitution. An example here would be appropriate. To my mind, this case illustrates the contribution of law to the development in Ghana. At first sight, the case, uh, Homer, uh, 
Human Human Council versus Electoral Commission, Center for Human Rights and Several Liberties in the Attorney General and the Electoral Commission, 2010 Supreme Court Honor Report 575, which was decided by the Ghana Supreme Court, would appear to have little to do with law and development. I don't know why I said that, but I know. The main issue raised in the case, which in fact consisted of two consolidated cases, was whether prisoners were entitled to vote. In spite of Article 42 of the 1992 Constitution, which provides that every citizen of Ghana, hey, I actually went back in, um, of 18 years of age or above, and of sound mind has the right to vote and is entitled to, re to be registered for the purposes of public elections and referendum. The Attorney General had argued in this case that it was in the public interest that convicted offenders are punished, kept under lock and key and not allowed to vote. The Supreme Court rejected this contention and held that there was no justification for denying prisoners their unqualified right to vote. This right was conferred on all adult Ghanaians who are saved by Article 42 of the Constitution. As I said in that case, quote, that's the table, not me. Nothing in the core values and spirit of the 1992 Constitution justifies the restriction on prisoners' right to vote that is advocated by the learned Attorney General. There is thus no basis for implying the restrictions argued for by the Attorney General to qualify the clear and unambiguous language of Article 42, unquote. However, it is lamentable, as pointed out by Professor Raymond Atuba in his third sterling book, that, quote, notwithstanding the Supreme Court departed from the, <coughs> the proposition espoused by Date Ban in the Osebwatin case, decisions of the court after that departure still create doubt as to the current legal position. In some of these subsequent decisions, the Supreme Court seemed to be towing the line of the Ateba JS in the Oseb Watin case by declining jurisdiction to enforce the, the Constitution on the ground that the constitutional provisions sought to be enforced were clear and unambiguous. Notable cases are made of aggressive versus Attorney General and Asari and Attorney General and General Legal Council. Some other subsequent decisions of the Supreme Court have followed the reasoning in Nobu Court versus Attorney General. This turn of events creates a cloud of confusion and inconsistency in our jurisprudential space, making it difficult for one to tell the direction of flow of our country's constitutional law in this area. This must be a cause of worry to students and practitioners of constitutional law." Unquote. Realistic independence of the judiciary. I want to emphasize that there is a vast chasm between independence of the judiciary in theory and its independence in practice. Thus, as explicitly stated by Dr. Date Ban in his aforementioned book at page 90, quote, <clears throat> independence of the judiciary has two dimensions, the institutional and the personal. Personal independence relates to the commitment of individual judges to the judicial values that ensure their impartiality and fairness. I'm here referring to values such as eschewing corruption and not allowing ethnic and other particularistic considerations to affect judicial determinations. Institutional independence of the judiciary, on the other hand, relates to the constitutional statutory and other arrangements put in place to assure the independence of the judiciary. Issues that are cosmically dealt with 
under institutional dependence, independence include separation of powers, security of tenure for judges, including appropriate provisions on the appointment process of judges, the conditions of service of judges, and the process for the removal of superior court judges, financial and administrative autonomy for the judicial. The measures are what make judicial independence justified. It will be unacceptable to have independent but unaccountable judges. Now well, I'm getting to the end. <laughs> Is it lunch time? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, I'm finishing. I'm finishing. <laughs> I too need lunch. Uh, the James Chachi Quisin's decision by the Supreme Court is with all due respect scandalous in that the court in the teeth of the subtle maxim res judicata et non quieta movere re-adjudicated the same matter that has been adjudicated upon by the High Court on the merits. Never seen this type of thing in any judicial system. All that was left was its execution according to court processes. Again, the stress laid by the court on the statutory processes for acquisition and renunciation of citizenship shot itself in the foot. If the certificate of renunciation is so mandatory and conclusive, why was it not conclusive in its effect to qualify Jachi question? when he received the data 26 November 2020, whereas the parliamentary election was held on 7 December 2020. Statutes, judgments, and documents must always be applied with consistency, both in the letter and spirit. These must always be construed holistically and as instruments of justice, since it is a well-settled principle that the duty of a court is to do justice, and the court should not be turned away from doing justice. In the 2013 presidential election petition, 2013 Supreme Court Annual Report Special Edition, 73 at 141, I stated as follows, quote, again in Osman and Tedham, 1972 G&G, &G, 1246, second edition, CA, and Osman and Kalio, 1972, G and G, 1380, the Court of Appeal held that though the respondents were members of the Convention People's Party, whose constitution made all members of Parliament of the Convention People's Party members of the party's regional executive committee, that did not, without more, make the respondents members of such committees, and therefore disqualified to contest the 1969 parliamentary elections, which they had won. Let me explain a bit here. Here was a decree that stated that all members of the regional executive committees of the then Convention People's Party were disqualified from taking, from contesting the elections. Literally taking it, it means if your name is on that list, you should be disqualified. But these judges bent on true justice. Said that, oh, but that alone cannot make you just a member. Then you should be, member means an active, must be attending meetings, yeah. doing service. So these people are not disqualified. We need such judges. The decision in Osman and Kadio is even more striking. Though the respondent has secured the exemption from disqualification from contesting the parliamentary elections, it was submitted that since its exemption had not been published in the Gazette, upon which publication it will have effect under paragraph 35 of NLC Decree 223-1968, the same was inoperative, notwithstanding uh, that under paragraph 37 of that decree, the decision of the exemptions committee was final and the constitution 
which provide inter alia for the sovereignty and welfare of the people of Ghana, the supremacy and enforcement of the constitution, and the blessings of democracy. Constitutionalism has been well explained by some eminent jurists in Ghana. In his very able book, Constitutional Law of Ghana, Text, Cases, and Commentary, Professor E. Kofi Abochi states at page 32 thus, Constitutionalism as a concept can be defined as the limitation placed on the exercise of legal and political power. The concept of constitutionalism is peculiarly important for African countries, given the long-standing experience of dictatorship, anarchy, and misrule on the continent. As colorists, constitutionalism and responsible government have been said to be mutually reinforced. Constitutionalism promotes responsible government in the sense that it compels government to act in a manner consistent with expectations for the enforcement, uh, for the confirmation of power and respond to feedback from the citizen. This is what is missing in Africa. I, I like that part where he says, um, constitutionalism promotes responsible government in that, in the sense that it compels government to act in a manner consistent with the expectations for the confirmation of power and respond to feedback from the citizen. In this context, one can accept that constitution constitutionalism is a welfare-oriented concept to the extent that it seeks to ultimately champion the welfare of the government by ensuring that governments exercise conferred powers in the best interest of the government. It's brilliant and beautiful. This is what our constitution has ordained for us. Is it happening? Very well. Um, <clears throat> Also, in his thoroughly researched book, The New Constitutional and Administrative Law of Ghana, from the Garden of Eden to 2022, Professor Raymond Atuba states at page two as follows, quote, the mere existence of a constitution is not enough for proper governance. A constitution can lead to constitutionality or constitutionalism. Constitutionality is the rule of law at the constitutional level, no matter what the content of the law is that rules. Constitutionalism, on the other hand, is good governance or people-centered governance at the constitutional level. With constitutionalism, there is limited government, people-centeredness, protection of minority and other rights, fairness, justice, equity. In countries such as the United States, which practice constitutionality and not constitutionalism, a constitution exists alongside social concerns like racism, gender inequity, and the prison's industrial complex. These are incompatible with the countries that practice constitutionalism. See also Professor Date Bass, very scholarly book, Selected Papers, and lectures on Ghanaian law, page 76. The appointment of judges, particularly of the Supreme Court, as the fulcrum of constitutionalism and the rule of law, has its hiccups. It is the Judicial Council that recommends suitable lawyers or judges for eventual appointment by the president. Sometimes, some judges are recommended by the Judicial Council to the Supreme Court over and above more experienced and senior judges, even though they are not more competent and experienced than their seniors. Often, when there is regime change, some of the sideline senior judges now get recommended for appointment to the Supreme Court through the same Judicial Council, but they then become juniors to their earlier juniors by reason of their later appointment. In practice, however, 
These later appointed judges often write the unanimous or lead judgments in difficult cases shortly after their appointment to the Supreme Court. Certainly, eyebrows can be raised over such practices. What can be the justification for such things? Nonetheless, depending to some extent on the judicial season, the judiciary has deepened constitutionalism in Ghana, notably the nullification of the 31st December holiday celebration funded from public funds, the freedom of choice of independent counsel by state bodies instead of the Attorney General despite Article 885, where there is conflict of interest, see Amegache versus Attorney General uh, 2012, one Supreme Court, Ghana Law Report 679. National Media Commission and Attorney General. So though that case delayed, but we unanimously held that the President had no power to appoint the persons managing the state uh, the statutory bodies managing the state-owned media. As stated by Professor Dateba in his third book at pages 17 to 18, constitutionalism is about having limits to the powers of constitutional bodies and enforcing those limits. The judiciary, through its exercise of the power of judicial review, is accordingly a vital actor in this process. The Ghana Supreme Court has been quite effective in protecting the legal framework of the liberal multi-party democracy, whose grown law in the is the 1992 Constitution. An example here would be appropriate. To my mind, this case illustrates the contribution of law to the development in Ghana. At first sight, the case, Ahuma, uh, uh, Ahuma, uh, Ahuma or versus the Electoral Commission. Center for Human Rights and Several Liberties in the Attorney General and the Electoral Commission, 2010 Supreme Court Ghana Report 575, which was decided by the Ghana Supreme Court, would appear to have little to do with law and development. I don't know why you said that, but anyway. The main issue raised in the case, which in fact consisted of two consolidated cases, was whether prisoners were entitled to vote in spite of Article 42 of the 1992 Constitution, which provides that every citizen of Ghana, hey, I actually went back in, um, of 18 years of age or above and of sound mind has the right to vote and is entitled to, re to be registered for the purposes of public elections and referenda. The Attorney General had argued in this case that it was in the public interest that convicted offenders are punished, kept under lock and key, and not allowed to vote. The Supreme Court rejected this contention and held that there was no justification for denying prisoners their unqualified right to vote. This right was conferred on all adult Ghanaians who are saved by Article 42 of the Constitution. As I said in that case, quote, that's that ever not me. Nothing in the core values and spirit of the 1992 Constitution justifies the restriction on prisoners' right to vote that is advocated by the learned Attorney General. There is thus no basis for implying the restrictions argued for by the Attorney General to qualify the clear and unambiguous language of Article 42, unquote. However, it is lamentable, as pointed out by Professor Raymond Atuba in his said sterling book, that, quote, notwithstanding the Supreme Court departed from the, <clears throat> the proposition espoused by Date Ban in the Osebwatin case, decisions of the court 
after that departure still create doubt as to the current legal position. In some of these subsequent decisions, the Supreme Court seemed to be towing the line of the JS in the Osei Boateng case by declining jurisdiction to enforce the, the Constitution on the ground that the constitutional provisions sought to be enforced were clear and unambiguous. Notable cases are Mayor Abrese, versus Attorney General and Asare and Attorney General and General Legal Council. Some other subsequent decisions of the Supreme Court have followed the reasoning in Noble Court versus Attorney General. This turn of events creates a cloud of confusion and inconsistency in our jurisprudential space, making it difficult for one to tell the direction of flow of our country's constitutional law in this area. This must be a cause of worry to students and practitioners of constitutional law, unquote. Realistic independence of the judiciary. I want to emphasize that there is a vast chasm between independence of the judiciary in theory and its independence in practice. Thus, as explicitly stated by Dr. Date Bang in his aforementioned book at page 90, quote, <clears throat> independence of the judiciary has two dimensions, the institutional and the personal. Personal independence relates to the commitment of individual judges to the judicial values that ensure their impartiality and fairness. I'm here referring to values such as eschewing corruption and not allowing ethnic and other particularistic considerations to affect judicial determinations. Institutional independence of the judiciary, on the other hand, relates to the constitutional statutory and other arrangements put in place to assure the independence of the judiciary. Issues that are cosmically dealt with under institutional dependence, independence include separation of powers, security of tenure for judges, including appropriate provisions on the appointment process of judges, the conditions of service of judges, and the process for the removal of superior court judges, financial and administrative autonomy for the judicial and measures are what make judicial independence justified. It will be unacceptable to have independent but unaccountable judges. No, well, I'm getting to the end. <laughs> Is it lunch time? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, I'm finishing. I'm finishing. <laughs> I too need lunch. Uh, the James Chachi Quisin's decision by the Supreme Court is, with all due respect, scandalous in that the court, in the teeth of the settled maxim, res judicata et non quieta movere, re adjudicated the same matter that has been adjudicated upon by the High Court on the merits. Never seen this type of thing in any judicial system. All that was left was its execution according to court processes. Again, the stress laid by the court on the statutory processes for acquisition and renunciation of citizenship shot itself in the foot. If the certificate of renunciation is so mandatory and conclusive, why was it not conclusive in its effect to qualify Jachi Kwesin when he received the data 26 November 2020, whereas the parliamentary election was held on 7 December 2020? Statutes, judgments, and documents must always be applied with consistency, both in the letter and spirit. These must always be construed holistically and as instruments of justice, since it is a well-settled principle that the duty of a court is to do justice, and the court should not be turned away from doing justice. In the 2013 presidential election petition, 2013 Supreme Court Ghana Report Special Edition 73 at 141, 
has stated as follows, quote, again in Osman and Tedham, 1972 GNG 1246 second edition CA and Osman and Kalio 1972 GNG 1380 the Court of Appeal held that though the respondents were members of the Convention People's Party whose constitution made all members of Parliament of the Convention People's Party members of the party's regional executive committee that did not without more make the respondents members of such committees and therefore disqualified to contest the 1969 parliamentary elections which they had won. Let me explain a bit here. Here was a decree that stated that all members of the regional executive committees of the then Convention People's Party were disqualified from taking, from contesting the elections. Literally taking it, it means if your name is on that list, you should be disqualified. But these judges bent on true justice. Said that, oh, but that alone cannot make you just a member. Maybe you should be, member means an active, must be attending meetings, doing service. So these people are not disqualified. We need such judges. The decision in Osman and Kadio is even more striking. Though the respondent has secured exemption from disqualification from contesting the parliamentary elections, it was submitted that since his exemption had not been published in the Gazette, upon which publication it will have effect under paragraph 35 of NLC Decree 223-1968, the same was inoperative Notwithstanding uh, that under paragraph 37 of that decree, the decision of the exemptions committee was final and public image of the judiciary in Ghana is reflected on social media. And here I'm referring to um, an article by one Dr. Lawrence Apia, who has um, lamented the present state of affairs at length. He makes concrete points. The only warrant I think is likely to be a politician. <laughs> He's saying that uh, this current trend has to be reversed by uh, Mahama when he takes over. That's why I suspect he's a politician. <laughs> Why are you? But his points are good. That doesn't mean that we should rubbish them, as happens in this country. Somebody makes important points. They are good for the country. But those who are steeped in rabbit politics will just rubbish. Oh, he's an enemy. That's right. This type of life. Where is it? Where we are today? That's what happens when people become hypocritical, become stooges yes. to the establishment. Yes. Oh, yeah, tight. Well, um, okay. I'll give you the reference on social media. You can access it. That's where I also saw it. <laughs> Uh, why did they publish this thing? Um, yes. Ghana News Online dot com, 16th October 2023. That's where you can find it. Uh, go and read it. He makes points. He's actually complaining about certain How? a motion to <coughs> arrest the closure of the limited EC registration um, was pushed, listed for 17th October when the registration exercise was to end on 2nd October. <laughs> he has pointed out all this. I mean, I don't know. Anyway.
um, the executive can do whatever it wants when it wants to remove a judge. I was referring to Amos Sechi JS and he's saying that the appointment procedure for the courts should be streamlined to avoid <laughs> such things. Aha, uh -huh. here, yeah. let's see. This Amos Sechi, well, it's unfortunate he tendered his resignation because I was on the committee to investigate him. And I tell you that he needn't have done that. Can't say more. But before I was he, he left. Now, his uh, exit from the Greece is a great war to some people. Out of others. See, wrongdoing cuts is like a double-edged sword. You think you are using it to cut your neighbor, you don't know when it can come back to cut you. That's why the best thing is to be fair, steadfast. In principle, everybody will be satisfied. The politicians, that's not their cup of tea. Um, let me conclude now. Just I read the conclusion. It's very short. So, what matters most is the realistic auditing and restructuring of the judiciary, and indeed all other governmental institutions, because just as the cyanide of illegal mining galamse has devastated our forest lands and poisoned our water bodies, so also has the cyanide of political corruption poisoned our governance institutions. Appointments to the judicial or any other government governance institution must be made by thoroughly independent bodies based on nothing but merit and not on things like protocol, chronism, ethnicity, or other improper considerations. Now I have a problem. Maybe some of you can help me to solve it. Um, there's an advertisement for employment into an institution. The criteria are set out. Now understand there's something called protocol. How does it fit into the scheme of criteria? Protocol, so it's also a qualification. <laughs> I can't understand. But here it's happening a lot. This type of thing. And Ghanaians too, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, generally Ghanaians like cutting corners, uh, looking for something. Oh, you know that man. I see him, you have. It's not healthy. You can do that and get in. Your son or your relative, if it doesn't matter who he is, a human being, is obstructed, although he has sterling qualities that aside, and some mediocre person is put in. How does that help this country? It's happening. Um, service conditions must be reasonably attractive and presidential and other political pressures. Uh, sorry. The security of tenure of office must be enshrined. Uh, the executive powers of the president and his functionaries must be drastically curtailed. There must be real separation of parliament from the executive branch. The emphasis should be on good and sincere governance in the interest of the people and not on hollow, over-exaggerated notions of electoral confirmation of power on anybody or group of persons. Now, see the democratic process as it is being practiced. Is it is that the democracy, the constitution has ordained? Is that what we want? To me, it's just used as a 
smoke screen. In front of it, values and principles are preached behind it. Deep seated subversion of all. But no meaningful political reforms can be reasonably expected, even under a regime change, without sustaining the political renaissance which has started and is going well in Ghana. That's why you find, that's why I've agreed to come, because I lost hope. But when I see these young people, so I, what, I, Grandma, I've never seen him, I hear he's here. Can you favor me with uh, me seeing you? Uh, but be careful with politicians. You see, enthusiasm, you should do it. Even as I'm saying here, hey, but see, if you throw a careless thing, get out to you, have no defense. So just keep to the principles, insist on the principles without falling to the temptation of a kind of pedestrian political garbage that is spewed out on our airwaves almost every day. That aspect is not necessary. It is for this reason that I would like to acknowledge, encourage, and congratulate nationalists like Kwesi Pratt. I've never seen him, but I've always praised him. Not this, not the first time. I did so at Cape Coast when I was launching a book in 2020. Dr. Arthur Kennedy of the USA. Ah, this man, if I had my way, would have been a model president for this country. Mm -hmm. I think he followed his activities. Very principled, oh, fair minded. But when he contested MPP presidential, I understand he had only one vote. <laughs> <laughs> you see? This is a kind of <laughs> politics we, 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 we practice. Very sterling man. Oh, you should get away. <laughs> and then you bring some, even say, some places. You put a stone, we vote for a stone. Now, today, the effect of voting for stones. <laughs> uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy of the USA, Dr. Jampo, I've never seen him, but. I followed on social media, I understand he's in the political science department. Yeah. You see here, I don't think so. I'll find time and, and, and get to know him. He's a proper man. Very fearless and impartial. That's the important thing. Um, Professor Bokwin, eh? Bok Bokwin. Buck, Buck, ah, I've seen on social media some handsome young man. He's a prof already. He's steadfast. Is uh, is in this university? Yes. Business, okay. Business. Okay. I'll try to know him personally and encourage him. I'm so enthused by his nationalistic stance. Professor Ajman Dia of the Center for Democratic Development. I've never seen him, but on social media, like him. Recently, I hope I've got his name right, Dr. Asariba, is a retired lecturer in the KNUSC Political Science Department. Amwako Ba, thank you. I was wondering whether I'll correct it. Yes, but I said recently. You see, listen. Kwame Piani, ah, sterling man. Unfortunately, I had to disqualify him. At my first constitutional case on the Supreme Court. Uh, fine man. When I saw him, I said, oh, very nice man, both physically and from what I heard about him, popular. But then, he tried to stage a coup, and uh, it didn't work. And the constitution disqualified people who indulge in acts in inimical to the state security. So I had no way. I 
two. We were three in the majority. That was one of them. I just come to the Supreme Court. But I like him. After they have been following his this thing. Uh, on this. Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamako. I've never seen him, but it's another. Kevin Taylor. I've, I've praised him before at Capos, but I said I don't know why he will not just make his point but indulge in invectives. I mean, it's not necessary. You are making concrete points. Those with, you know, slanted pushes will just say, oh, but I'm you take him seriously. You see? You can make serious. I don't know where he gets the information from. I'm in Ghana, I don't know most of his things. <laughs> Those things will help us. But then he will insult and insult. Why? People will just use that to say, oh, you nah, see? All right. Um, Emmanuel Wilson, my friend, Junior, the chief crusader against corruption in Ghana. Uh, I've added in them the Ghana National Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, those of you who are Catholics, I encourage you, always buy the Catholic standard every Sunday. You see a lot of sound principles there. And they are steadfast also, fearless. I'd like to congratulate the staff of that newspaper, the standard, they are consistent. They don't toy with facts. No. Unfortunately, I was overtaking my time. I don't know most of these people I have mentioned personally. But I followed their works on social media. And I'm impressed. However, I hope that they remain nationalistic no matter the regime in power. That's very important. Because if some of them are just doing it because they are opposed to this president, that's not good enough. If the next regime comes, even if it's your own party, you have to remain like that. If you are to be true and sincere to Mother Gandhi, then we'll get somewhere. I also wish to acknowledge some of the many civil society organizations, such as Ghana Center for Democratic Development, Ghana Integrity Initiative, Citizen Ghana Movement, Africa Center for Energy Policy, Parliamentary Network Africa, PEM Plus Bites, Media Foundation for West Africa, Send Ghana, One Ghana Movement Center for Democratic Development, Democracy Hub, Occupy Ghana, an Institute for Democratic Governance. I don't know most of this, but where I've got this list from, this case, they were the people who brought the constitutional action in favor of Domilovo. That's why I got these names on the title of the case. And it shows where civil societies have gotten to. And that is what can help this country. Um, okay, so it's lunchtime. Thank you very much. Thank you.